Just how far will a person go to keep a lie under wraps? For one Salt Lake City wife and mother, that question could only be answered after an exhaustive search of a Utah landfill. After he killed her, where is the body? The next day, they told us, you know, that her body was out in the landfill. Lori Soares was born on New Year's Eve, December 31, 1979. She was quickly adopted by her soon-to-be-divorced parents, Thelma and Harold Soares. When Lori was 10, she moved from Salt Lake City, Utah to Orem, Utah, along with her mother. She would meet Mark Hacking in the mid-90s as they both attended Orem High School. She didn't know it, but on the day she met the man who would one day make her his wife, she also met the man who would one day end her life. The two didn't immediately hit it off, but as these things often happen, the two eventually fell in love and were married in 1999. Everyone who knew the young Mormon couple described their relationship as happy and full of joy. In 2004, the 27-year-old Lori excitedly told her parents the couple was pregnant with their first child. Lori was described as a bright woman who worked as a stockbroker's assistant for Wells Fargo. In the summer of 2004, she gave her two weeks' notice as the couple planned to move on July 19th so Mark could attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Medicine. In Mark's family, education was a big deal. His father was a pediatrician, his mother a nurse, and his brothers had good careers in science. Success seemed to run in the family, and Mark would continue the string of victories. Lori's friends have said how proud she was not only of Mark's achievement in education, but how proud her family was of him too. They implicitly trusted Mark with their daughter's life and happiness. They treated him like he was their own son. From the outside, it was the perfect life, at least until it fell apart on July 16, 2004. That Friday, Lori phoned the college to finalize housing arrangements and she received shocking news. Co-workers described Lori as being distraught and crying, but she told nobody the horrible secret she had just learned. Two days later, on July 18, 2004, the couple attended a going-away party for Lori, thrown by her co-workers. She was described as not being her usual bubbly self, but with a new baby on the way, a husband entering medical school, and a cross-country move, nobody was too alarmed. After leaving the party, Mark and Lori were captured on surveillance video, stopping at a convenience store on the way home. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Lori hacking before her life was tragically cut short. The next morning at 10.07 a.m., Mark called the Salt Lake City Police Department to report Lori missing. He said she had gone for her usual morning run and never returned. He phoned again at 10.46 a.m to say he found her car parked at City Creek Canyon with no sign of her. A search was quickly launched. Numerous volunteers came forward to help in the search while Mark stood in front of news cameras all day speaking on the situation. He spoke of how grateful he was for all the help and how he just wanted to bring his wife home. He also mentioned her pregnancy, which only furthered people's hope to find her alive. Anyone who is familiar with the Chris Watts case almost 15 years later will see clear similarities here. Um, I brought him to the police station. We need to do some quick interviews, get some background information and some history. He said there were no problems in the marriage. I start asking him questions regarding who he is, what is his life like. He said that he is going to be going to med school. And I said, Mark, you know, what are you specializing in? And he says, oncology. And I said, I don't mean to sound dumb, but how do you spell that? And he couldn't spell it. So, okay, there's, there's a problem here. The police soon found inconsistencies in Mark's statements to them. He had said he was trying to find her when he first phoned the police. He even said he found her car at the canyon she went running in. Unbelievably, Mark was not out looking for Lori in between those two calls to the police. He was out buying a new mattress. 
According to him, Lori had spilled something on the old mattress a week earlier and it was time to replace it. In reality, Mark had disposed of their mattress in a church dumpster across the street. So I asked Mark why he had purchased a new mattress and he said that Lori had had her period and had stained and soiled the mattress so he got rid of it and bought a new one. I asked him when he had gotten rid of the old mattress and he told me it had been a week or so and, that, and I said well where have you been sleeping because the whole apartment's full of boxes and he tells me that he and Lori have been sleeping on the box springs and Lori isn't sleeping on box springs. It, again, it doesn't make sense. It's not true. Knowing something and being able to prove something are different. You hear that all the time. Knowing the truth and proving the truth are two different things. And so I think we knew our truth was that he had harmed Lori in some way, but our ability to prove that had not been met yet. In the eyes of law enforcement, Mark went from worried husband to prime suspect, and a search warrant was granted to their home. And on one of the side tables right there is a red purse. That's Lori's purse. Women don't go places without their purses. Mark has said she's driven to Memory Grove to go running, didn't take her purse, didn't take her wallet. There, police found Lori's purse, her wallet, car keys, and a hunting knife with blood on it. They would also discover on that same day that the driver's seat in her car had been adjusted for someone much taller than Lori. There was also blood in the back seat of her vehicle. On June 19, 2004, police would bring Mark in for questioning. One day after this interrogation, on July 20th, police received a number of frantic disturbance calls. Mark was found running around a downtown hotel, nude, with only his sandals on. So a lieutenant responded to the scene of that call once they heard who was involved in it. Um, and she was able to kind of see some things that normal behavior indicative of a mental illness or a manic episode wasn't exactly what Mark was doing. He was admitted to a psychiatric facility, but it's easy to see he was already trying to build his insanity defense. But that was quickly dismissed. According to one unnamed official, insane people don't stop to put their sandals on. He was naked, but he was wearing flip-flops or sandals still. So he had the wherewithal to protect his feet, but run around nude outside. Mark's delicate house of cards would collapse entirely on July 21st, when both Lori and Mark's families found out that not only was he never accepted to medical school, he had lied about even graduating from the University of Utah. Lori's family was just as shocked as his own to learn the news. Neither of the families had suspected him of lying. He built up a fake persona and then lived it out so well he fooled everyone around him. After dropping out in 2002, Mark spent years pretending to attend classes, study, write papers, and he even faked cross-country travel to attend fake medical school interviews. He was also known to spend a large amount of his free time hanging out at the local 7-Eleven, playing video games. Later in the investigation into her disappearance, a typed letter from Lori to Mark was found in their spare bedroom. No one knows when she wrote it, but it's assumed it was after she found out about his years of lies. It's a sad, pleading letter that says, I want to grow old with you, but I can't do it under these conditions. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. Lori wouldn't have to imagine life with or without Mark much longer because that single phone call on July 16th to the University of North Carolina would be the catalyst for her murder days later. Mark saw his web of lies being untangled and knew in order to protect them, he had to kill Lori. This was confirmed when two of his brothers went to meet him while he was on his psychiatric hold to beg him to tell the truth. His brothers, who he had so badly wanted to impress and keep up with professionally, were able to get their brother to tell the truth. On July 24, 2004, Mark confessed to them that on the 18th, he and Lori had had an argument after she learned the truth about medical school. While she slept in the early hours of July 19th, he shot her in the head with a 22 rifle and disposed of her body in a dumpster. 
Mark's brothers told his attorney, who told the police. And finally, on August 2nd, Mark was arrested. Mark killed her? That can't be right. <laughs> you know, so then I talked to the hackings. And of course, the parents were weeping and all their family was just, they were just out of their minds, you know, with sorrow and surprise that Mark had done such a thing. Mark Douglas Hacking was formally charged with first degree murder on August 9th, 2004. I think the next thing I thought of was, well, where did he put her after he killed her? Where is the body? The next day, they told us, you know, that her body was out in the landfill. That was almost as bad as knowing that Mark had killed her. Two months later, Lori's remains were found in a municipal landfill by the police. Mark pleaded guilty to first-degree murder on April 15, 2005, narrowly dodging the death penalty as Lori's remains were too decomposed to confirm her pregnancy. His confession to the court, she was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, but I killed her and I took the life of my unborn child and put them in the garbage, and I can't explain why I did it. The most important part of stories like this is for us to focus on the victims, to remember them as the bright lights they were rather than as the victims they eventually became. Lori was buried at a grave site with her family removing hacking from her headstone. Her mother Thelma said, we just felt that Mark obviously didn't want her anymore. Her married name was instead replaced with Filinha, the Portuguese word for little daughter. Her family went on to establish the Lori K. Soares Hacking Memorial Scholarship at Lori's alma mater, the University of Utah. It helps women in difficult, disadvantaged situations and those facing other personal challenges. It's a wonderful way to remember a beautiful woman who was killed over Mark Hacking's inability to tell the truth. Mark was sentenced to a minimum of six years to life in prison. However, he will not be considered for parole until 2035. He's serving his sentence in Central Utah Correction Facility, where he had sent autographs and other items to a murder memorabilia site and has since written a biopic of his own life. A clear pathological narcissist through and through, Mark Hacking is the worst kind of liar the kind who believes he deserves the world. He has such a sense of grandiosity that anyone who got in the way of his ego, anyone who unraveled his lies, became a target. Eventually, they became actual trash to be discarded, hopefully taking his secrets with them. One thing is for sure, no matter how many years he's locked away, there's no escaping the personal hell he created for himself the day he disposed of his wife unborn child and freedom.